everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Crime and Coffee Couple. My name's Allison. And my name's Mike. Hi, Mike. Hey, baby girl. How's it going? Oh, good, good. It's been a little while. It has. Since we've, uh, we've recorded live, and I know, you know, we didn't miss an episode because I tell people you're a psychopath, and you make sure that we get out because we say every Sunday we'll have a new episode, and by golly, do we. Exactly. So it's been two weeks since we've recorded live, and yeah. it's nice to be back here with you. Yeah, good to see you again. And for those of you who don't like our little um, banter. Know, banter in the beginning, uh, just skip forward five minutes, and you'll be okay. Your life will still be okay. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, we'll go over kind of what we did and, and all that good stuff. Just quickly, we, yeah. Yeah, we took a little family vacation, a 10-day vacation, started in Seattle for a few nights. I've always wanted to get to Seattle, have never been. So that was great. The Boy, the weather is chilly there. Well, I mean, anything's more chilly than Florida. Yeah. Kind of a, like a humid hellhole, basically, yeah. is what Florida is for the summertime. And summer is really about seven months down here. So yeah. Maybe eight months. So yeah, right now we're definitely in the summer. Just had baseball practice with the sun today, and it was like 80... 890 outside just like from what did we start at 9 30 or something like that and just till noon i was like oh terrible whereas i was freezing my tail off through most of the day in seattle and then we moved on to the wyoming area stayed in idaho on the border of wyoming went to grand teton national park that's where we basically stayed and then we traveled into yellowstone national park twice and yeah. that was just fantastic oh my god so people ask me how was it and i'm just like floored like the best vacation ever because we like to be outside at least you and me yeah Kids and not like, be like dressy we don't like to go to fancy restaurants yeah because we went through jackson the city there that's like a big ski town and all that and it's got a lot of shops and stuff which is fine but it's just like allison's like eh, get me out of here well, it's very touristy. It's shopping and dining, basically. Yeah. You got like t-shirt, about 17 t-shirt shops. Not, And they're not crappy. Like they're nice clothes and No, stuff. Jackson, Wyoming was adorable. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. It was just a little too touristy for us where we were staying in Victor, Idaho. And it's just like a super small town, cute milkshake shop we would go to. And who knew that... Uh, what is it? Uh, Huckleberry Huckleberries. Shake. Yeah. That was like a thing in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, in Seattle too. Yeah. We so had a Huckleberry ice cream in Seattle and you're like, this is good stuff. I was obsessed with it. And then they saw, she saw they had Huckleberry shakes near our place where we were staying and she's like, we got to get a Huckleberry shake. Yeah. It was home of the famous Huckleberry shakes and it was delicious. So we'd be like out hiking. I'm like, why won't anyone let me just have a Huckleberry <laughs> milkshake? <laughs> like, I just want one right now. Oh, and I wanted like those you. like pumping through my veins IV. It's pretty good. It's basically blueberries um i'd say pretty much the same like thing. a tartar blueberry maybe a little tart mm -hmm, yeah. but it was fantastic oh man for those of you who like coffee like we do obviously we're the crime and coffee couple i got a little coffee from uh, wyoming right here next to me but uh roasted in wyoming i'm sure it's from some other place in south america but um there's awesome coffee places obviously in seattle oh we drank our weight in coffee in oh, seattle everywhere we got ourselves i got a lot of lattes usually i'm a black coffee guy just because i like the bitterness but going that many coffees it's a lot so I kind of got some lattes. We did the latte with the hemp milk at that one place that we loved. That's what I was going to say. The best coffee shop I've ever been to in my life, Victrola Coffee. Oh, fantastic. It was in um, Capitol Hill. Capitol Hill neighborhood. In Seattle. Yeah. So fantastic, but man alive. There were a couple of mornings I was a little jittery because I had had way too much coffee because well, I the sun rises there at like 5, 15, 530. If you like sleep, man, do not go to the Northwest in the summertime. Because here it's at least an hour and a half later, I would say. So I was up at the ass crack of dawn every day. So by 630, I was like, let's get out of here. Let's go walk. We had 30,000 steps most days. And we just started our day drinking coffee and it just kept going. Well, you had 30,000 steps because you'd walk like a penguin. You're like, <laughs> where I had like 25,000. So. so we had a great time. Oh. We saw a lot of animals. We saw 13 bears. 13 bears. What? Black bears, grizzly bears. Mostly grizzlies. Yep. Um, Mar uh, bald eagle. Um, you Moose, name it. Moose, elk. Bison. Yeah. Tons so of bison. It was fun, but oh. we're, we're glad to be back. I'm a lady of routine. I definitely live and die by my routine. So I'm always a homebody. I'm glad to be home. I missed our dog like terribly. I cried a couple of times. She did. She's weird <laughs> like that. Because she's on our little, we have a little camera. We call it the poppy cam. And it, it points at the area where she looks out the window and sleeps. So a couple of times I was just looking at her sweet face and I may have, I may have teared up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But it's good to be back. Yeah. And uh, we want to say thanks to a uh, awesome listener that uh, sent us some cookies. Yes. I don't know if you saw our Instagram feed, but they were custom made. They say crime and coffee couple and our trademark. Bye. 
and yep. Mike and Allison, the husband did it and all kinds of stuff. And thanks to Rachel uh, for those cookies. And I'm going to put links to Rachel's um, you know, cookie shop uh, online. It's on Facebook, I think. So. Um, and I have been hitting those cookies kind of hard. Yeah, yeah, she has. <laughs> so thanks a lot, Rachel. You're going to give me Rachel. A... This bikini bod is no more. Yeah, we're going to wait a few more months for that bikini, I think. They're That's delicious, okay. though. And Un... they are so beautiful. And really happy to report that I haven't died yet. Like, I don't think they're poison, but if they are, the Rachel did it. So <laughs> Rachel didn't do it. She's lovely. Yeah. And I was like absolutely touched by that. I just couldn't believe somebody would take the time to make us cookies like that. Yeah, they're they're really well done. So yeah, yeah I mean impressive because I do not have that creative patient hand. I mean these cookies were amazing. I lo- was just staring at them. I'm like I could in a million years I could not do this. Yeah. Well, you can try. I'll eat them. Yeah. She was. Uh, she wrote us a sweet note too and said uh, I'm very organized. It's like okay. Well, I guess we each have our things because I might be organized, but you are super talented in cookies. Sometimes you need that for the artistic brain, you know, just kind of all over the place and absorbing mm-hmm. ideas and stuff. So, uh, but yeah, hey, and by the way, if you can leave us a review or give us five stars on any platform, that'd be awesome. We'd appreciate you so much. And uh, I'd say that's about the end of our banter yeah. for now. We could go on for days, but nobody wants We're going to shut our traps. But yeah. the point is, if you guys have been considering going out to those areas, especially Seattle was great. A uh, lot of untreated mental illness, man, that was kind of scary. We saw multiple people actively using drugs in the middle of the street. We saw people smoking either meth or heroin Allison off learned, of tinfoil. Allison learned a term. What is that called? Chasing the dragon. Chasing the dragon. And now after Allison learned chasing the dragon, she said, ooh, I think those people are chasing the dragon. It, it, it was like, like 5 p.m. and just like a group of people are just smoking off of tinfoil. I'm like, yeah. huh. It's pretty people sad. passed out with crack pipes. You know, Chicago, we, we grew up in Chicago, and there's a lot of, obviously, people that are down and, and out in a horrible situation of being homeless, but it wasn't as much drug use, like, out in the open that I've ever seen. And the big difference we talk about in Chicago, like, people will come up to you and say, hey, man, you got some money? You have some money? I can get some coins or whatever, or food or something, whereas in Seattle, like, it was almost like they wouldn't talk to anybody. Nobody interacted with us. Yeah. There was a lot of, you know, screaming and talking to oneself and drug use, but... You know, it's it's very sad. It really it it yeah. It's and we hard hope, to hope see. The best for those people. I really I just wish there could be some something that could help them or yeah. help the situation. But on that note, we're going to get straight to it. Yep. So this story is a listener suggestion. This was a suggestion from Tracy. So thank you so much, Tracy. This is the horrifically tragic and sad story of the murder of Shanda Sharer. So it was 1991, and Shanda Scherer was a 12-year-old girl. She was attending Hazelwood Middle School in New Albany, Indiana. Shanda was born on June 6, 1979, so she would have been our age right now. She's about two weeks uh, young, uh, younger than me. So she was born to Steve Scherer and Jacqueline Vaught in Pineville, Kentucky. Her parents divorced, and she moved to Louisville with her mom after her mom remarried. Shanda participated in cheerleading, volleyball, and softball while she attended 5th and 6th grade. At that point, she was still living in Louisville. Her mom divorced a second time, and then they moved to New Albany, Indiana in June of 1991. Shanda was described as outgoing. She was someone who made friends very easily. She loved going to school dances. She loved social situations. So her mom, Jackie, described Shanda as delightful and happy, a typical little girl who was athletic and into every sport. Basically, anything she could possibly be in, she would join. She was tender-hearted, and if she thought that she upset you, she would immediately tear up. She was very thoughtful, she was kind, and she was considerate. That's pretty rare for a youngster. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of young kids are just, you know, focused on themselves. So for her to be able to identify that people, you know, she hurt someone, that's special. Yeah, our daughter is very much like that. We have an 11-year-old, and she's very um, sweet and kind like this. So I, I thought of our daughter. Um, So she's only a few days into the school year because, again, she had just moved to this town in, what did I say, June of 1991. So she was entering a new school year in a new school, and she got into a fight with a classmate. This was 14-year-old Amanda Heverin. And during their detention, which they both got put into because of this fight, they actually ended up talking and becoming friends. Isn't that funny how that happens? Mm -hmm. Kids can do that, man, especially especially boys, but um, girls too, that's good. Well, you know, I'm sure the fight, they didn't know each other. Why they got into a fight, I don't know. But was it then physical? You know? It sounded like it well, was because 
Shanda's mom, Jackie, was hesitant about the friendship that started because it started with Amanda punching her daughter. So, yes, it sounded like it was physical. (laughs) And the fact that Amanda was a couple of years older because Shanda's 12 and Amanda's 14. But Shanda assured her mom that Amanda was a good person. So as their friendship continued, they communicated by passing notes to each other throughout the school day. I could heavily, heavily relate to this. My girlfriends and I, as well as Mike and myself, we passed notes. Even though Mike and I didn't go to the same school. No, you made me write notes. Um, <laughs> I, I thought it was, yeah, I, whatever. I wanted to communicate you with you. You happily it did it. Well, I'm a, you know, maybe it helped me be a good writer, and I'm a pretty decent writer today. You are a good writer. So I would pass notes with people throughout the school day. So when I read that, I was like, oh, I remember that. So they started passing notes like crazy. Amanda was complimenting Shanda on her style. She told Shanda that she was pretty. She also asked Shanda if she liked girls. And at some point, their friendship started to progress into a romantic relationship. Mm. Wow. So So 14 and 12 and progressing into a romantic relationship. mm -hmm. That's pretty young. Yeah. Um, any, are we going to have background on Amanda's upbringing? Um, not very much. Not much, but we'll talk more. Because, you know, you can think about kids like our 14-year-old son. He's not interested in girls. I mean, he, he sees girls and he notices them, but he's not like talking about girls to mm-hmm. us, at least to us, maybe to his friends he does or you know, whatever love interest he has. Um, so, you know, same with our daughter. Whereas we have some friends that are like, you know, kind of crazy about boys or, you know, whatever. It yeah. Might be. Neither yeah. of our kids are very outspoken about being interested, but, right. you know, they're young. So in October of 1991, the two attended a dance together. They were confronted by Amanda's former girlfriend of more than a year, 16-year-old Melinda Loveless. And Melinda was very jealous of Amanda's new relationship. Melinda was born in New Albany on October 28th, 1975. She was the youngest of three daughters to parents Marjorie and Larry Loveless. Larry was drafted into the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War. He returned and was considered a hero at that point. However, Marjorie would later say, and when I say Marjorie, this is his wife, would later say that he was a pervert who wore her and her daughter's underwear and refused to stay monogamous. Oh monogamous, God. excuse me. I mean, you know, do whatever you need to do. Go ahead and buy some girl's underwear and put it on, but don't be wearing your daughter's. And There were a lot of very disturbing things that oh, happened. Gross. So this Larry, is Melinda's parents? This is Melinda's parents. Larry enjoyed watching Marjorie have sex with other men and women, and it sounds like it wasn't exactly something that Marjorie really wanted to do. It was kind of like she was coerced into doing so. Larry often hoarded his paychecks. He wasn't sharing his income with the family. Extended family members reported that the loveless daughters would often visit their homes and be very hungry, which is, is just horrible. That's crazy. So Marjorie tried to commit suicide multiple times during her children's childhood and at one point she withheld sex from larry for a month and because of this he violently raped her as his daughter's watch oh my god what a scumbag man terrible in the summer of 1986 marjorie forbade larry to go home with two women that he had met in a bar and in retaliation he beat marjorie so severely that she was hospitalized that's very scary and horrible behavior and the fact that his three daughters are watching this Uh, that's i mean they're all messed up forever basically so at that point in time he was convicted of battery so the extent of abuse that he inflicted on his children is not very clear but court testimonies did claim that he molested several family members and melinda slept in bed with him until he abandoned the family when she was age 14 something's not right there Uh, yeah you know a lot of things happen yeah so a cousin named teddy had been molested by larry from age 10 to 14 so this guy is into everything whatever whatever yeah He, uh, Teddy testified in court that Larry tied his three daughters up in the garage and raped them in succession, though the sisters did not confirm this account. Obviously, they probably were groomed by this guy, traumatized, Lord knows. And yeah, told if you ever say anything, I'll kill you, that kind of stuff. So in November of 1990, Marjorie caught Larry spying on Melinda and her friend. She attacked him with a knife sent him to the hospital. After this, Marjorie attempted suicide. At that point, Larry filed for divorce and then moved to Avon Park, Florida and abandoned the family. Melinda was actually devastated by her father abandoning them, especially after Larry got remarried and he eventually stopped all contact with his family. Okay, so so we've got these three girls, Melinda, Amanda, and Shada. Shanda. Shanda, okay. 
So Melinda and Amanda met in 1990. They began dating, and when Melinda finally came out to her mother, she was initially furious, so she eventually came around and was accepting. In the fall of 1990, Melinda and Amanda's relationship began to deteriorate, and Melinda eventually blamed the demise of the relationship on Shanda. And again, Shanda is only 12 years old. Yeah, we've got, like I was going to say, Melinda's 16, Amanda's 14, Shanda's 12. So the difference between 12 and 16, it's Big a difference. kid versus like a practical adult. Mm -hmm. Somebody who can drive around and you know do whatever they want, whereas a 12-year-old is under their parents' eye and inside of a house. Like, it's a kid. Yeah, you have to remember that. You know, it might only be four years. When you're 30 and 34 there's no difference but 14 or i'm sorry 16 to 12 big difference there sure so in november of 1991 shanda's mom found notes between amanda and shanda she quickly realized that the two were having a physical relationship this didn't sit well with her mom because her daughter was so young so during this time shanda's grades were also dropping her behavior was drastically changing so jackie demanded that shanda stop seeing amanda Jackie indicated that she had no issue with the fact that her daughter could potentially be a lesbian. She said, the issue for me is that she had this older person pressuring her into doing things. Yeah. And then, you know, Amanda might be saying, this is normal. Everybody does this. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's, it's hard because she's young. So yeah, I, I don't blame her. They didn't detail what the notes said. Sure. But it did sound like there was some pressure happening. And again, her daughter's behavior was changing in a way that was not positive. Sure. It was very negative. So at that point, she's saying, you know, my daughter was 12. She was a baby. Jackie decided to transfer Shanda to a private school to put distance between her daughter and Amanda. After the transfer, Shanda's grades improved and she began trying out for sports again. I read basketball and cheerleading. So again, she's coming out back to being her Herself. social self. Yeah. So despite the different schools, Amanda continued to write Shanda notes and call her frequently. Melinda's jealousy of Shanda is only growing during this time, and she's writing notes to Amanda explaining her hatred of Shanda, wishing that Shanda was dead. Amanda claimed that she gave these notes to her father, who then turned them into a youth prosecutor, but said that there was no follow-up from there. Nothing resulted from that. Other words, you know. I mean, yes. And there's a lot of kids writing a lot of things, especially at this age, teenagers, a lot of feelings going on. Mm -hmm. And it was the 1990s, so maybe things weren't taken quite as seriously. I don't know. Right. So on January 10th, 1992, Melinda gathered with three girls with the intention of seeking some sort of revenge on Shanda, believing that, again, she was the reason why her relationship ended with Amanda. I mean, maybe just have a conversation with Amanda, right? Instead of targeting this little 12-year-old. A 12-year-old? Crazy so person. with Melinda was 17-year-old Lori Tackett, 15-year-old Tony Lawrence, and 15-year-old Hope Rippey. So 17-year-old Lori Tackett was born into an extremely religious and strict family, and she says that she remembers people from church praying over her and trying to perform exorcisms during her childhood. Wow. She also indicated that she was molested at least twice when she was younger. In May of 1989, her mother discovered that she was changing into jeans when she got to school, and as a result, her mom tried to strangle her after she confronted her that night. Jeez, man, this is nuts. There's a lot of bad shit happening There's in some, all these people's lives. Yeah, really messed up stuff happening. So at that point in time, social workers did get involved. They started doing unannounced visits. When Lori's mom found out that Hope Rippey's father had bought the group a Ouija board, she went to his house and demanded the board be burned and that the house be exercised. I'd be like, lady, you're out of your mind. Oof. Never come over to this house again. And I, you know, maybe our kids are going to hang out, whatever they want to do. You know, uh, your, your daughter is more than welcome over to our house, but stay away from us. You are a crazy person. Yeah. So as Lori turned 15, she became more rebellious as teenagers tend to do as they get older. They want their own freedom. She also became fascinated with the occult and often pretended that she was possessed by Deanna the vampire. She would do this in order to impress her friends. Her self-harm behaviors really ramped up in early 1991 when she began dating a girl who was involved in the occult, and she ended up being hospitalized in March of 1991. 
Two days later, she returned and was admitted to the psychiatric ward after deeply slitting her wrists. Oh, poor thing. She was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and confessed that she had experienced hallucinations since she was a young child. She was discharged on April 12th, 1991 and dropped out of school in September. And at that point, Lori became obsessed with hurting people and said that it was her destiny to murder someone and spend the rest of her life in prison. That's so sad. She has to have like so much pain inside Mm -hmm. of her and just like now it's redirected instead of at herself. Now it's like, I'm going to go kill somebody. Basically, Yeah, it's terrible. So Lori met Melinda in October of 1991. They didn't officially become friends until the next month, which was November. And then moving on to 15-year-old Tony Lawrence, she was good friends with 15-year-old Hope Rippey. So that's kind of how they got involved. She was abused by a relative at age nine. She was raped by a teenage boy at age 14. By eighth grade, she also became began self-harming. She also attempted suicide. 15-year-old Hope Rippey claimed that her home life was turbulent, although I did see her say in an interview that she was not abused at all when she was a child. Yeah, she, but you never know what's going on. You don't know. And she herself began to self-harm at age 15. So on the evening of January 10th, 1992, Lori picked up her friend Hope as well as Hope's best friend, Tony. They drove from Madison, Indiana to Melinda's house in New Albany. Hope and Tony had never met Melinda before, so they're meeting her for the first time this evening. So when they arrived at Melinda's, they borrowed some of her clothes and Melinda showed them a knife, saying that she wanted to kill Shanda with it. And only Melinda knew Shanda. So the rest of the group, the other three girls, had never met this 12-year-old girl. As the parents of Shanda, like, could you imagine somebody talking about killing your child? No. Like, with a knife? Like, this is the the knife I'm going to kill that your child with. I cannot. People imagine that this conversation is going on at a house, like, actively. Like, was actively. hurting your child. Oh, my God. So, again, only Melinda knows Shanda. Lori, Hope, and Tony have never met her. So as they got ready, Melinda explained that she planned to intimidate the 12-year-old girl because she was a copycat who stole her girlfriend. Killing Shanda was absolutely talked about, though during a Dr. Phil interview, Hope later claimed that she did not believe Melinda when she said this. She said that she went way further than she thought it ever would. Okay, well, public service announcement, uh, anybody, if if you're in a group and somebody's talking about killing somebody, even if it seems in jest, probably get yourself out of that situation and try to you know, get them calmed down enough or they wouldn't do something like that. Well, you'll find that Hope actively participated. Okay. So she believed that Melinda would beat Shanda up. That's what she was expecting that night. She was going to beat her up and nothing more. So Hope drove Lori's car to Shanda's house. Again, Hope is only 15. She's using her learner's permit and driving Lori's car. She drove it to Shanda's house in Jeffersonville, Indiana. Shanda was spending the weekend at her dad's house. And along the way, they stopped at McDonald's for directions. Just before dark, they arrived at the house and Melinda told Hope and Tony to go to the door and tell Shanda that they were friends with Amanda. She instructed them to invite her to go with them to see Amanda at a place that they called Witch's Castle. So what Witch's Castle was, it was an abandoned, ruined, isolated stone house that sat on a hill overlooking the Ohio River. The house served as a local teenage hangout, and Lori told the girls that it was once owned by nine witches and that the townspeople burned the house to get rid of them. That was like the folklore behind it. Mm -hmm. So Shanda told them that she couldn't go until her parents were asleep. She instructed them to come back at midnight after her dad and stepmom went to bed. So Shanda's dad did hear part of the conversation. I'm sure he didn't hear the part of her saying she was going to sneak out, but he could tell by the way that her daughter was talking or his daughter was talking that he she didn't know these girls. It was yeah. clear. So um, initially, Melinda was mad when Tony and Hope came back to the car and said she can't come until later. But then she said they would go, but, you know, they're saying, calm down, we're going to go back and we're going to get her. So they, at that point, they drove to Louisville for a rock concert at the Audubon Skate Park. And Hope and Tony lost interest in the concert at some point. They went back to the parking lot where apparently they engaged in sexual activities with two boys in Lori's car. And then after the concert, the group of girls drove back to Shanda's house, as they said they would. And Melinda said that she couldn't wait to kill Shanda. But at the same time, she also found her attractive and wanted to have sex with her. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is what she's saying as they're driving. So she told the girls that she only intended to, to use the knife to scare her. But again, there was definite talk about her saying she was going to kill her. I mean, Melinda's all over the place. Definitely, you know, a lot, a lot of mental things going on here. She's hot, up high and low and she's beautiful and I want to make out with her and I want to kill her. And mm -hmm. blah, 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 all over the place. So they arrive back at Shanda's house right around 1230 a.m. Now we're in the early morning hours of January 11th. So this time, Tony said, I am not going to go to the door to retrieve Shanda. So at that point, it was Hope and Lori that went. Initially, when Shanda came to the door, she was reluctant to join them, but she did agree and she went and changed her clothes. Mm -hmm. Little did she know that when she got into Lori's car, Melinda was hiding in the back seat under a blanket holding a dull knife. So as they started the drive, the girls were talking with Shanda. They were asking about her relationship with Amanda. And soon Melinda jumped out from under the blanket. She threatened to slit Shanda's throat unless she admitted to stealing Amanda from her. At this point in time, she's basically threatening her and holding the knife to her throat. Right. And I can't imagine how freaking scared this 12-year-old child must have been at that point. Yeah. So Shanda was terrified. She was sobbing. She was trying to respond, though Melinda refused to listen. When they arrived at Witch's Castle, the other three girls assumed, again, they're saying they're assuming that Melinda's only going to scare Shanda into breaking up with Amanda. So they forced Shanda to strip her clothes off as well as her jewelry. The girls took her Mickey Mouse watch. And that just really broke my heart because this little girl has a cute little Mickey Mouse watch on. And she's being forced to become naked in front of these older girls. I'm getting like sick. This is horrible. So they took her watch. They took her rings. They themselves put them on as they're taunting her and threatening her to threatening to cut off her hair. So seeing passing cars along the neighboring road, they became unnerved and decided they wanted to move to a different location. So they drove to an area known as the burn pile, which was behind Lori's house. By this point, Shanda's arms and legs had been bound, and she was defenseless. Tony and Hope were scared. They said they decided to stay in the car at this point. Melinda began to beat Shanda with her fists and repeatedly slammed Shanda's face into her knee, cutting Shanda's mouth terribly with her own braces. She was bleeding profusely from her face and her mouth at this point. Melinda tried to slash Shanda's throat, but she wasn't able to because the knife that she chose was just too dull to do it. Oh, my God. What a monster. A monster. This is a 16-year-old girl. At this point, Hope got out of the car and held Shanda down as Lori and Melinda took turns stabbing Shanda in the chest as well as in the feet and legs. Are you kidding? Like no. stabbing? Oh, my this God. Is, this is terrible. <sighs> they strangled Shanda with a rope until she was unconscious, and then they placed her in the trunk and told Hope and Tony that Shanda was dead. They drove to Lori's house. They went inside to drink soda and clean themselves up until they heard dogs in the neighborhood barking. When they went outside to investigate, they realized that Shanda was screaming in the trunk and trying to get out. Oh, poor kid. Lori went outside and struck Shanda several times with a tire iron, returning to the house covered in blood. She washed up and took out her ruin stones, which I didn't know what they were. Rune stones? Rune, yeah. And told the girls their futures with them. During this time, the girls talked. They decided that they had to kill Shanda at this point. Whether she was alive or dead, they didn't know 100%. But regardless, they were going to kill her for sure. So at 2.30 a.m., Lori and Melinda drove. And it sounded like they kind of took a joyride. Hey, to... Remind me, does Lori know uh, Shanda? No, no, nobody but Melinda had so, ever known Shanda. But Lori had this thing in her that she needed to like. She kill was going to kill someone and spend yeah. the rest of her life in prison. That's what she said. It was her destiny. Awesome. So they drove to a nearby town of Canaan, Indiana, while Hope and Tony stayed behind to nap. You know, so the thing was, is later on, it was like, oh, I was intimidated. I was this. I was that. But then they were at Lori's parents' house for four hours with Melinda and Lori gone. They did nothing. Yeah, F both of you. F all four of you. Like, go to hell. Take all the jail time you deserve because you're, I mean, your kids, but it's tough shit. I mean, you acted like adults here. So, 
I mean, they acted like piece of shit adults, mind you. But, like the worst possible adults there could ever be. Because uh, at one point you said Hope held down yes. Shanda while Melinda like and Tony stabbed her. Mm-hmm. Like Tony stabbed her. No, Tony didn't stab. Oh. It was Lori and Melinda Lori were stabbing Melinda. her but as Hope, Hope held, her, held down. her down. Yeah. Yes. Did Tony uh, do anything? Tony wasn't doing any of that. But still no. you're there. She's participating still. Oh, God. She's not saying anything to get this girl help. And she's still alive at this point. Basically equally guilty. Right. So as they drove, they heard Shanda in the trunk crying and making gurgling noises. Lori stopped the car and Shanda sat up. She was covered in blood. Her eyes rolled back into her head and she was unable to speak. At this point, Lori beat her and sodomized her with the tire iron. Jesus Christ, man. Like, I mean, what kind of evil is inside of you to do something like this to a 12-year-old child? She needs to be removed from Earth as quickly as possible. Oh, man. Just before the sun rose, they came back to Lori's house. Sorry. God. I mean, it's... I, I got that same feeling about a few stories that we've told before where it's just like a kind of a darkness overcomes my brain. And it's just... Uh, it's not about me. This is about poor Shanda. Right. Obviously. Like, you can't believe something like this could happen. And we've had a lot of stories like this, unfortunately, where kids and everybody just has to look out because something can turn like really wrong really quickly. And then all of a sudden you're in the middle of it and you're doing things you didn't think you were capable right. of. I'm sure Tope and Tony both thought they wouldn't be part of a, a murder, accomplices to murder this evening. At 15 years old. Now, obviously their defense is that, no, yeah, I was just pressured into it or whatever. But at some point you see it going the wrong way. You got to get out because our brains are crazy in that they just start making these things like normal. Yeah. You know, you see the stabbing or whatever, and then you just hold people down. You do things that you didn't think you would do. And I'll say it again. I, I don't, I could never do something like that. Right. We don't think we are, but I mean, it's safer to think that you're capable of it. I'm, I'm and not. Think, no, I don't think I am, but I'm, it, we have so many stories. Yeah. You know? So just before the sun rose, they came back to Lori's house to wash up. Hope asked what happened to Shanda and Lori told them the story as she laughed. Their conversation woke Lori's mom, who yelled at her for staying out late and bringing friends to the house. Lori told her mom she would drive the girls home, and they all got into the car and drove to a burn pile near Lori's house. I'm assuming this is the same place they were at earlier in the night. There's burn piles all over Indiana. I guess so. So um, they wanted to basically show Tony and Hope Shanda at this point. Tony refused to look while Hope sprayed Shanda with Windex and taunted, You're not looking so hot now, are you? Whew. They Hope. drove at that point to a gas station near Madison Consolidated High School to get gas. They bought a two liter bottle of Pepsi. Lori emptied the soda and filled the bottle with gasoline. While at the gas station, Shanda was making so much noise that they actually had to move the car because they were fearful that the attendant would hear her. At this point, Shanda had been tortured for 10 hours. From here, they drove to a place that Hope was familiar with on Lemon Road. As they drove... Oh, this part's going to kill me. It gets worse? Yeah. Man, well, I mean, it's just more of the same. They could just hear her... So whimpering she's still over and over mommy 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 oh my god she's 12 it's just awful sorry i mean any human would feel just as sad and anybody thinking that this is worked up it's not it's just human emotions I don't even know what else to say. Usually I try to cover something. Yeah. It's just, I don't know. What sort of say about this? So they placed Shanda. She was still alive. They placed her in a blanket. They carried her to a field right off of a gravel country road. Hope poured gasoline on Shanda and Lori took a match, knelt down and set her on fire. They drove away, but Melinda wasn't convinced that Shanda was dead. So she insisted that they drive back a few minutes later. They poured the rest of the gasoline on her. They later said that they believed that Shanda's body and the knife would completely disintegrate, thus getting rid of any evidence. Because I think they asked, like, why would you have done this, like, right off of the road? They thought she was just going to be gone. So at 9.30 a.m., the girls stopped for breakfast at McDonald's. And while they ate, they laughed, sh saying that Shanda now looked like one of the sausages that they were eating. This is the type of sickness that's running through these these girls. Hope is playing right into Melinda and Lori's whole thing, man. That's just sickening. And, and Tony's just sitting there, too. And uh, they're all, all reprehensible. 
Tony said that she felt horrified and she called a friend and told her friend about the murder. Lori dropped Tony and Hope off at their homes and returned home with Melinda. They cleaned the car, they washed the trunk with a hose, and they drove to Melinda's house around 3 p.m. So Melinda discovered that Amanda, Shanda's girlfriend, was at River Falls Mall, so she paged her and said that there was an emergency. When Amanda called her, she told Amanda that they had killed Shanda and arranged to pick Amanda up later that day. Melinda's friend Crystal Wathan came over and they told her what they had done to Shanda. Uh, Not being very quiet about this whole thing. I guess they're waiting to get caught. This all crumbles very, very quickly. No doubt. So the three girls left to pick Amanda up. They brought her back to Melinda's house and Amanda wasn't like fully believing what they had done. Well, yeah, like you didn't kill her. You're crazy. Yeah. Like, the, yeah. All four of you are telling me you killed her. Okay. Yeah. Sure. And then said it said that Amanda didn't believe them and comforted Melinda, who is now hysterical. Oh, you're hysterical now, bitch. Well, she's flipping the switch to be a victim or whatever. After you be. tortured a 12 year old girl for over 10 hours. Now you're the one that's crying. Yeah. Uh, You don't get to shed those tears. So when Lori and Melinda showed Amanda and Crystal Shanda's bloody handprints and bloody socks in the trunk, it's dawning on them that these girls are telling them the truth. But they didn't do anything about it. They didn't tell anybody. So in the meantime, um, it's the morning of that day, January 11th, and two brothers from Canaan, Canaan, Indiana. I always want to say Canaan, but it's Canaan, Indiana. They were driving to go bird hunting when they saw something on the side of the road. They initially believed that they were looking at a mannequin. And I hear that time and time again when I hear different stories. Well, sure, because you don't expect, you know, we're in our brains. We always, you know, look for um, the same things over and over again. And you don't expect to see a a dead human body on the side of the road. And of course, you know, we do know that Shanda was badly burned. So at 10.55 a.m., they called police, and at that time, Jefferson County Sheriff Buck Shipley Shipley, and detectives began their investigation. They initially assumed that it was a drug deal gone wrong because they couldn't believe that this could possibly be related to locals since the area was not used to violent crimes. And and like we hear a lot about, they're not, you know, they can't deal with this kind of stuff. They don't have all the same capabilities. And it's like a big city. Right. From what I remember reading, I believe that the last time somebody was murdered was about three years prior. So, um, of course, that morning, Steve Scherer, Shanda's dad, is waking up and noticing that his daughter wasn't home. So he's calling neighbors and friends looking for her. Maybe she had gone out and he didn't know. No one had seen Shanda. So he and his ex-wife, Jackie, met and they filed, I'm sorry, they, I'm sorry, they filed a missing person report at 1.45 p.m. So Shanda's official cause of death ended up being smoke inhalation because she was still alive. When they set her on fire. What a warrior, man. I can't believe she stayed alive from all these beatings and the horrible things that happened to her. She really wanted to live. She really did. But they, they made sure she didn't. Yeah. So at 8.20 p.m., a hysterical Tony Lawrence and her parents went to the Jefferson County Police Department and gave a statement about what happened to Shanda, naming the three other girls that were involved. Buck Shipley, who was investigating the case, was able to identify the victim to Shanda Scherer's missing persons report, and then a detective used dental records to positively identify the body as belonging to Shanda. So on January 12th, Melinda and Lori were arrested, and the prosecution immediately declared that they would be tried as adults. They were charged with first-degree murder. All Good. four girls involved were tried as adults. Um, they removed... They made a deal which removed the death penalty from being an option for Melinda and Lori because they pleaded guilty. Okay. I mean, as long as they spend forever in jail, that's fine. Well, you'll hear. Oh, good. I can't wait. Because they were both only 15, Tony and Hope were not eligible for the death penalty. I know. I'm going to be pissed off. I'm just waiting. Yep. So in their mugshots, both Melinda and Hope were beaming with smiles from ear to ear. It is so so hard to read the details of this case and look at the mug shots with this two out of four of them smiling from ear to ear as if they're at a carnival in a photo booth. And Hope was interviewed on Dr. Phil in the presence of Jackie, Shanda's mom, and Paige, Shanda's sister. And Dr. Phil was like, what What was with the smile? And he's like, she's like, I was crying and the detectives were trying to cheer me up. So that's why I was smiling. It's like, 
were the detectives trying to cheer her up? Uh, who knows? I mean, She's like, because I was 15 and I was crying. Well, so they I mean, were trying to. Yeah, you picture a kid. Maybe they didn't know what she did. But I mean, I don't even know. so, it's like. I will tell you, though, it was really hard to look at. Yeah. So Melinda and Lori were sentenced to 60 years in the Indiana women's prison in Indianapolis. However, under Indiana statute, the sentence can be cut in half with good behavior. Tony Lawrence was sentenced to 20 years in prison, and with time reduced for good behavior, she was released on December 14, 2000, after serving only nine years. Hope Rippey was sentenced to 60 years, just like Tony and Melinda, but she appealed her sentence, which was then reduced to 35 years. She was released on April 28, 2006. Oh, no. Lori Tackett was released on January 11, 2018, and oddly enough, it was the 26th anniversary of Shanda's murder that she was released. Great. In October of 2007, Melinda's attorney requested a hearing to argue her release, stating that she had been profoundly retarded from her childhood abuse that she had endured and indicated that this had not been properly conveyed during her sentencing. The hearing was delayed to December of 2007, and then on January 8, 2008, the appeal was rejected. However, on Thursday, September 5, 2019, 43-year-old Melinda was released from prison under supervision by the Kentucky Probation and Parole after serving only 27 years of a 60-year sentence. How does that happen? So everyone is walking free. Oh, my God. Every single one of these scumbag, joking, laugh pieces, filled, like hate-filled, horrible human beings. Like, Lori... I don't know if she's still saying that she wants to go to jail anymore or whatever. Obviously, she put a good story together to get out. But, like, that's the type of... I know they're all so young. You know, mm -hmm. that that's the other thing. You got to think they still had child minds. You know, your mind isn't fully developed till after, like, 25. To maybe understand the, like, finality, finality. of what they were doing. Well, that's what you talk about for, like, an 8-year-old or yeah, something. Yeah, I mean, not, come not on. Like 15, 16, 17? You don't know that death is final? Bullshit. Yeah. Oh, man. That's so horrible that they're all out. And uh, because of the sexual abuse allegations that came to light during the trial, Melinda's father, Larry Loveless, was arrested in February of 1993. He was charged with rape, sodomy, and sexual battery. Now, that guy is a, just oh, a demon. A demon. Oh, what a weirdo. What a freaking... Yeah, I mean, you're doing the sexual stuff that's all okay with everybody, you know, consensual, that's fine, but... No, these are children he's molesting. No, I'm saying, yeah, the consensual, like, if you want, you know, your wife and she's okay oh, with Oh, yeah, it, sure. Some people have open marriages. Sure. I'm not judging that. I'm not judging that. any of that. The stuff with your family and raping anyone at all, it's just, it's like, so horrible. I, you know, everybody that listens knows how much we hate rapists. Right. So. so, the problem is, though, is that he, so he did remain in prison for two years while he was away, awaiting trial. But the majority of the crimes that he was being accused of happened between 1968 and 1977. And because of the statute of limitations, most of the charges had been dropped and he was released in June of 1995. So ultimately, he he maybe served two years. And there's no fixing that guy. He's out doing it again. Well, you know I'll let you know. Larry killed himself in 1998. Oh. Hey, that's the best part of this whole story. He jumped into traffic in St. Louis, Missouri. Let's hope he didn't kill anybody else when he did so. The worst part of that is the person that hit him, unfortunately. Right. Who has to, you know, live with keep that. that in their mind. But at least they killed somebody that sucks. So, I mean, if, I, if it turned out that I found out that i killed larry i'd be like hey that's not bad i'd be like that's a pretty good day that's i just terrible. killed this scumbag piece of shit and my insurance is going to pay for this car so i think i mean that's a win as far as i'm concerned it's a piece of garbage in 2005 shanda's father died from alcoholism at age 53 and was buried next to his daughter i mean no doubt you're just trying to <sighs> escape life 24 hours a day knowing yeah. all these horrible things that happened to your sweet daughter her mom, Jackie Vaught, was interviewed by the TV series Deadly Women, and she indicated that Shanda's father did basically everything he could to kill himself after her murder, besides putting a gun to his head. He drank himself to death. She said that he died from a broken heart, and I do not doubt that. No. In January of 2009, the Shanda Sharer Scholarship Fund was created to provide two scholarships per year to students from Prosser School of Technology in New Albany. One is going to a student who's continuing their education. The other is going to a student who is beginning their career and assisting them in buying the equipment they need to do so. So I like that they're trying to, you know, do something positive. 
During a 2012 interview, Shanda's mom, Jackie, said that if you look into Melinda's eyes, there's nothing there. However, during her time in prison, Melinda began working to train puppies with the intention of helping disabled people under an Indiana program called ICANN, which stands for Indiana Canine Assistant Network. Once the dog breeders who, I'm sorry, one of the dog breeders who provides the puppies to the program was a burn victim themselves, as Shanda was, the breeder convinced Jackie to watch a video of Melinda working for the program. Jackie said she was taken aback by what she saw. She said she saw someone who was almost reborn. She saw that she was sincere and compassionate. And Jackie said, I think the ICANN program allows her to have something in her life that she can show love back to, and there's never betrayal on the other side. After watching the video, Jackie decided to donate a puppy named Angel to the program for Melinda herself to train in prison. She said that she did it to honor her little girl who she thinks of each and every day. And Jackie says, it's my choice to make. She is my child. If you don't let good things come from bad things, nothing gets better. And yeah, I know what my child would want. My child would want this. So I thought that that was really touching. Oh, well, yeah. Can you give her a hard time for that? And I mean, Jackie, um, she advocates against childhood abuse because she believes that the abuse and violence that Melinda grew up in her home molded her into the monster that she became that had the capability of doing such a thing to her child. 100% had something to do with it. But like we say, there's plenty of people that get you know abused and don't kill people it's you know it didn't help that's for sure and if we had less of it there'd be less horrible things like this happening 100 percent. yeah and melinda was young and if she can find some kind of a positive spin after she took poor shanda's life then you know so be it that that is a good thing and i i don't blame jackie for buying that that's awesome you know something in her daughter's name mm -hmm. you know that, that she, she feels an in her heart that that was something that shanda would have wanted for because sure. she was so kind and compassionate yeah and then again jackie was on dr phil and she said to Dr. Phil that she feels that Shanda meeting Amanda Heverin was the beginning of the end of her daughter's life, saying that Amanda is a predator who molested her daughter, that her daughter was only 12. She didn't know her sexuality at the time. She said that the way her daughter dressed and carried herself completely changed after she started her relationship with Amanda. She started confining herself to her room, wearing baggy clothing, failing in PE despite her athletic abilities. Like that was where she shined. It came out that she failed PE because she refused to change her clothing in front of other classmates. Hmm. And her sister indicated that Amanda was basically like controlling, controlling her and really um, jealous go going at her. Like Shanda was trying to end things and Amanda just like wasn't letting it happen. So they put a lot of blame on Amanda too. Yeah. Which kind of sucks. Cause you know, the whole reason this happened was because of Amanda. I mean, obviously Melinda, it yeah, wasn't... Amanda wasn't there the night that no. Shanda was murdered. Right. So she certainly didn't play a direct hand in her murder, but no. Shanda's mom does put a lot of blame on her. Apparently Shanda had written a letter to Amanda. She was, you know, only 12 years old. She forgot to put a stamp on it. So the letter came back and her mom found it. And that's where she found a lot of what was going on with sexual the sexual relationship she feels that amanda was the first link in the chain that led to her daughter's murder she believes that amanda is the reason why shanda is no longer alive yeah that's kind of a, a long step it's definitely melinda and Lori and hope yes i mean tony to an extent but you know tony was there for sure she could have said something while shanda was still alive 100 percent yeah but unfortunately, these four people, like, how do you find four people who who are capable of this? I mean, we have now probably a dozen stories, at least, of multiple people that you didn't think would be capable of something like this. Um, I mean, Melinda and Lori, definitely capable of something like this. But then Hope, like, coming in out of nowhere. And, you know, she had to have things going on. Like you said, she had a tough upbringing, I guess. But... Oh, it's just so such a yeah, sad story. she did face um, Jackie and ja um, Shanda's sister Paige on Doctor on the Doctor Phil show, and sat across from them and answered their questions. And she said she doesn't know why she went along with it. Is she it, like better now? Like she's never going to do something like that I, again? Did they go over that? Yeah, on the Dr. they Phil did. Show? And uh, she says she could never do anything like this ever again. I mean, I mean if you looked at her, you would have thought she was just like a normal person, right? That she could have never like. How do you look at somebody who took part in such a thing and think that, oh my God, you did that when you were 15? Yeah.
sick. So I know that was a tough one to get through. And, yeah. you know, it's just so tragic. But it's just to remember Shanda's Shanda, memory. Yeah, you know, absolutely. That, she could have been, you know, a, a lot better light in this world, mm-hmm. just like a lot of these stories. And uh, she wasn't shooting. Her light was put out by these scumbag pieces of garbage. After only 12 years of life. Yeah. So oh. it's just sad. Thank you so, for helping Sorry her about the breaking down of crying during the episode, but sometimes... Don't ever apologize. It's human It's humanity. just, it's too hard, especially having a, a 11-year-old little girl. Yeah. I just can't imagine what that, that those parents went through. I just can't. We all know somebody who's young, you know, yeah. or, or have known or will know somebody, mm-hmm. and it's just their innocence is just, you know, so precious. Mm-hmm. So thanks for helping us remember Shanda, and, you know, hopefully her good memory lives on. Yeah. But we want to say thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate it. And if you like what you hear from us, um, not only should you leave a review, but we have more bonus episodes. Uh, over a lot 25, more. 25, I believe. I Maybe think. even over 30. I don't know. I don't think it's quite 30 yet. It's 30-ish. So you go ahead over to Patreon. We got the show notes, uh, link in the show notes. And we want to say welcome to our latest Crime and Coffee Couple Club members, uh, Noemi, Dina, and Sarah. And Naomi, if your name is spelled or if your name is pronounced um, Naomi, then I apologize, but uh, it looks like it's spelled Naomi. So Naomi, Dina, Sarah, thank you so much thank for coming you aboard. Guys. You have access to a bunch of new episodes, and um, yeah, and you have direct access to us messaging. If you guys have any suggestions on cases we should cover, send us a message on Instagram or Patreon, and um, you know, happy to see what's going on. So. And we're happy to be back in live time with you guys. Thank you so much for being back with us, and until next time.